I grew up in what was, I think, considered a typical family. There was my mom, my dad, my younger brother, myself, what some people might consider to be maybe an above average number of cats. But our upbringing was far from typical. Before my brother and I were even born, it was my parents' intention to raise us in a gender-neutral household to the best of their abilities. And that started with my name. They named me Danielle so that as I grew up, I would have the choice of either identifying with Danielle or Danny, depending on how my personality turned out. When we were growing up, my brother and I were given access to the same toys. We were given things like Play-Doh, Kinex, Tinker Toys, things that excited the creative parts of our brain but paid no attention to gender. And this wasn't to say that we grew up in an androgynous household, but I think it was my parents' idea to see how we were going to turn out as people, not as their daughter and their son. We got older, and my brother and I had interests that diverged, which happens with siblings, but there was one thing that still held us together. We both discovered electronic music. He, drum and bass, me, house and electro. And it was through this mutual love that led us to go buy records together, to get incredibly bad turntables at home and practice for hours on end, to go to raves together. And my parents saw this, and instead of dismissing it as some fad that their kids were interested in, instead decided to take an active interest. They wanted to know more about it. And I distinctly remember this one time, my dad especially is a big music hound, and he pulled me into his office because he wanted to show off this artist that he had found. And he said, Danny, there's from amazing and I think you're really going to like them. They're strange. They wear these helmets. They're like robots. And I was like, Dad, I think I, think I know who they are, but you know, if you want to tell me about it. And he said, they're called the Punk Daft. Have you ever heard of them? I was like, yes. <laughs> I've heard of the Punk Daft, Dad. <laughs> this continued my interest for electronic music, and my parents obliged every step of the way. They sent me to MIDI camp at Oberlin College upon my request, where I was the only girl out of 25 participants. They gifted me a copy of Logic, music production software, for Christmas one year. And they helped me get an internship with the Chicago Recording Company in college, where for the very first time, I was able to actually physically touch mixing boards and sit in sessions to watch indie bands get recorded and see how commercials were made and how voiceovers were made. And for all of their support over the years, for my 18th birthday, with their blessing, of course, I threw a rave in a warehouse that they owned. And it got busted by the cops. <laughs> and my parents became the lucky recipients of the very first for Chicago's anti-rave ordinance for $10,000. Now, most parents would be really upset, and I think that's an understatement, but not my parents. My parents took the ticket to court, and they beat it. And not only that, they and they had an article days after the event. Looking back at it now, it's really interesting how my parents were able to reframe this in their situation. I got them a hefty fine. They spent days in court. I took time out of their lives, and they didn't punish me. Instead, they decided to celebrate the fact that I had found something I was so passionate, a culture that I had found identity with. It's because of the way they viewed that and supported everything that led to me having my career now. I am a full-time DJ, music producer, and music journalist. Now, it's secret that EDM has exploded in the past few years in America, right? It used to be this underground seed, and now it's a generational movement. It's worth over $6 billion today. As it started to grow around me, I noticed that all the journalists started to rephrase their questions to me. No longer did they want to know about my experiences as a music producer and as a DJ. They wanted to know what it was like for me as a female music producer and as a female DJ. And at first, I dismissed this um, and just put it aside as lazy. They didn't have the time or the effort to look up anything about me. But as EDM continued to blossom, it continued to happen. I watched as the number of female artists participating remained roughly the same. And soon everyone was asking these questions. Where are the female DJs? Where are the female And at a certain point, I was forced to admit 
that there was a very real problem that I was never aware of before, despite the fact that I had my fingers in almost every aspect of the industry. Consider these numbers, 91 and 9. 91% of the music that is on EDM labels is produced by men. 9% is produced by women. The DJ Mag Top 100, which is a list that's generally regarded to gauge the popularity of artists within the EDM community, featured two female artists this year. Ultra Music Festival, which is one of the more popular EDM festivals in the US, had 5% of their lineup occupied by women artists out of over 150 acts. And if we look at festival lineups as far back as 2004, that number has stayed about the same. The participation of women on festival lineups remains between 5 and 10%. 91 and 9, that's not a gender gap. It's a canyon. And I consider myself to be a very logical person. So I thought, if I looked at this, compartmentalized it, if I broke it down, I out, right? Because I was make it. This should not be an issue. But I couldn't figure it out. And so I began to look to people around me. I asked music journalists. I asked managers. I asked other DJs, other producers, men and women. And I asked Reddit, which might have been a mistake because I got over 300 comments in the span of 48 hours. And everyone had a different opinion. But despite all of the answers I got, there were three that kept popping up consistently. One, we don't have enough girls in EDM for women. Now, this is absolutely true, and I can't dispute this, because if we only represent 9% of the consumable music, then of course we don't have enough role models but we're not hard to find either. To make a point, I did a search for the easiest term that I could think of, which was female DJ. And the top article that came up profiled 10 amazing artists that I look up to doing great things with music production, DJing, and radio. Despite the fact that we're not really in the public eye, we're also not hard to find. So I had to eliminate this as a potential answer for what was keeping women out. Two. There is no sexism in EDM. This is laughable. The very fact that I work primarily in nightclubs, a space that is designed for lots of people to get very drunk in a short amount of time in a contained space, for you to believe that this is my workspace and I don't experience sexism, that's silly. I have been inappropriately touched by a male DJ in the DJ booth in front of a crowd. I've been accused of sleeping with promoters to get high profile gigs. And in doing the research for this very talk, not once or twice, but about five or six times, I was told that I was pursuing a feminist agenda, as if that was a bad thing. Why is it so terrible for me to inquire why there aren't women participating in the EDM arena? It's not an anti-male agenda. This is a pro-everybody agenda. I want everybody to be at the same party. Three, women are not interested in STEM-related fields. That's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, before we go any further, I feel like it's important to clarify why electronic music production is actually a STEM-related field, because some people think that making music is just a creative pursuit. If I'm making a song, I go up to my office, I flip open my laptop in Ableton, I make sure I have a couple of Red Bulls to the side. And then it's six to eight hours straight, me staring at the screen, typing away, not just composing, but also being an engineer, worrying about things like my EQ bands, making sure that my layers aren't phasing with each other, right? Thinking about my stereo field, making sure my hi-hats are sparkling at the outer edges of the spectrum. It's an unusual combination of art and science. So going back to women and not being interested in STEM, I took a look at myself. I was my own case study. I grew up in a household where my parents didn't push male activities towards me or female activities, but they just exposed me to everything. They gave me the tools to pursue what I wanted, and here I was making electronic music and fully engaged in something that required STEM skills. This idea that 
women are not interested in technology. This is something that, that persists, right, in our culture. And it's interesting that it does because we've disproven this. We disproved it a long time ago. This is not just one study that's been done. This is hundreds of studies, and studies done on aggregates of these hundreds of studies. As far back as 1967, and encompassing over three million subjects. The conclusion is always the same. The researchers never find any observable difference between boys and girls when it comes to math and science, great enough to create any statistical impact. Never. So it leads them to instead believe that the differences are societal, they're cultural, they're in our upbringing, they're environmental. What's especially interesting in all of this is that all of the women that I interviewed for this, and I interviewed a lot of them, they all echoed back the same idea. They all also believed that women were not interested in STEM despite the fact that they were doing it themselves. But, you know, it's not that hard to understand why. We think about how we're brought up. Globally, if we talk to parents about rating the intelligence of their children, they consistently rate the intelligence of their firstborn male higher than that of their firstborn female. When we look at the toys that are available to us, even on Target's website, the girls' toys section reads like this. Dolls, Barbie dress up, crafts. The second four boys is action figures, bricks, Lego. Then we reach adulthood and we find that those in hiring positions have an underlying bias when they hire towards the gender that already dominates that field of work. We find that older men, more experienced men, are more likely to mentor younger men, not younger women. And we find Across the board, women don't ask for what they want. And even worse than that, they usually believe that they don't deserve what they get. So yes, I could understand why all of these artists felt the same way, but it was very disheartening. If we, as women in our own field, don't believe that women are on equal footing, where are we? If we believe that somehow we're separate, we're different, we're segregated because of what we're interested in and our abilities, then we're turning the gun on ourselves and we're fulfilling a prophecy of being marginalized and separated and overlooked. Now, what's especially interesting is that with almost all of these same artists, when I talked to them about how they were brought up, they told me stories that echoed the same things I went through. They all had parents that encouraged their creative endeavors. They all had parents that didn't enforce gender stereotypes but they couldn't see how that related to themselves. I pointed out the correlation in one particular artist story, and she stopped. She thought about it, and she said, you know what? I never saw it like that. Maybe you're right. We're starting to see bridges being built in EDM. We're starting to see this come together, but you know, cultural changes, they take time. They take decades. They take generations. But we do have some important role models. We have people like Annie Nightingale. And if you're not familiar within the EDM community, she is uh, in her 70s, and she's been a presenter with England's Radio One since 1970. She's basically a pillar in our community. I spoke to Annie, and I asked her what she tells young women who want to get into electronic music. And she said, it's up to the women to not conform to gender stereotypes. It's up to you guys to not conform to gender stereotypes. It's up to you to be strong enough to recognize that this is an illusion and to act differently. What I want people to walk away with is that we won't have more female artists participating in this arena until there are more female artists participating. And I know that seems kind of redundant and obvious, but it's a numbers game. We have to get more people involved from the get-go. So how do we do that? How do we get more women involved? We have to let them know that it's OK to act differently than what they're used to. 
that it's okay to say no to the messages that they've been told thousands of times throughout their lives. We have to unlearn in order to learn again. And that can be difficult. I'm sure some of you have heard, what's the worst that can happen if you ask? Someone says no. It's actually much, much more impactful than that, if you rephrase it just a little bit. The worst that can happen if you don't ask is that you'll never know if the answer was yes. Apply that to yourself and think about how many yeses you've potentially missed out on. I want to challenge young women who are interested in producing music and in DJing to recognize when they hear that inner voice that tells them they're not good enough and do it anyway. When they want to ask a question, even if they feel uncomfortable, to do it, especially if they feel uncomfortable. And to know that the only way you're going to get better at doing something is to do it over and over and over again until it becomes second nature. And that doesn't just apply to music production and to DJing, but to your own behavior. Make today the first day that you do something. Interested in producing music, do it now. There is no tomorrow. If you're truly interested in making a change, it starts today. Call a friend that you know makes music. Ask if you can sit in on a session. Look up YouTube channels, watch some tutorials, bookmark them. Join forums. Ask how to create sounds that you hear in your favorite songs. And I'll, I'll do you one better. You truly don't know where to start. You have no ground zero. I'm here. Tweet me a question, and I'll do my best to answer. You'll actually find that most artists are very accessible and want to engage in a conversation with you. And through it all, don't allow yourself to feel scared about your own curiosity, about the fact that you're actually doing something about it. Because most people never even get to that part. They don't get to the doing part. Are you going to get no's? You'll get a lot of them. Are you going to get yeses? You will. The funny thing about success is that you're never really privy to the amount of no's that an artist had to get before they got the one yes that mattered. And if you continue to do this, you'll notice something. Your music will get better, more intuitive. Your time spent in the studio will be more energetic. You'll be faster. You'll know more. And the person that's sitting next to you in the studio will no longer be your teacher, but your collaborator. For a reason. Because you know what you're doing. You're confident in your abilities. And when you do have a question, you won't be scared to ask. I want to end this by letting you guys in on a little secret. This is my first time doing a public speech. <laughs> and they told me I was doing this two days ago. <laughs> and I finished this yesterday. When I said yes, I had a brief moment of terror. I've actually been experiencing a lot of terror over in that seat over there all day. <laughs> I thought I was a crazy person for agreeing to do this. I'm used to being in a booth where the focus is on me doing a lot of this and in listening to music. But I did it anyway. I'm here. Because if I had said no, I would have never known if the answer to can I do this is yes. Thank you.